One of my favorite things about interviewing athletes on the show is hearing how they face adversity and overcome that. Today's guest was a defensive lineman for Baylor. He was a prospect for the NFL. And just days before the NFL combine in 2016, he was accused falsely of sexual assault, which sent his life into a tailspin. For three years, he battled those legal issues, ultimately coming out not guilty, and now is making his way through the professional ranks on his way to the NFL. That is the goal. But today we're going to learn about his career, how he's overcome adversity, his mindset, and much more. You don't want to miss this episode of the Game Time Guru. So, what time is it? Game Time Guru! This is the Game Time Guru Podcast, where I interview sports figures from all over the world to help deliver a panoramic view on sports. So whether you're a former athlete, one of the crazies, or simply a casual sports fan, this is the perfect show for you, as we peel back the curtains and learn from our guests every single week. I'm your host, Shane Larson, and I'm helping you see sports through a different lens. What's going on, everybody? Welcome out to the Game Time Guru Podcast. My name is Shane Larson, host of the show for the last four and a half years. Want to give a special shout out to all the listeners who are out there, especially those who are tuning in for today's episode. Big shout out to you guys because you're the reason that we've reached 92 different countries, over 69,000 downloads of the show as we continue to grow across the entire globe. Now, today's episode super special. We're going to be bringing on a football phenom, a guy who has a, a very unique journey, a, an inspirational uh, journey and story to share with the rest of us. We're going to learn about his hard work ethic. We're going to learn about his journey and, and what he's up to now and what we can expect to see from him. His name is Sean Oakman, and uh, we're excited to have him. So, Sean, thanks so much for joining the show, man. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you a lot. Absolutely, brother. So, you know, Sean, obviously, we 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 rewind the clock a little bit. You know, you're you're a big guy. We you kind of got famous when the entire like meme started against Michigan State. The whole you know the big old meme that went across the entire globe. Everybody saw that you were like this big player for Baylor, big time, big time uh, athlete. But I want to rewind the clock even more because that's when the casual fans started realizing like who you were, right? The casual fans, those who didn't actually pay attention. But you've been playing ball for quite some time, and you had a journey up until then. So can you talk to the, the audience a little bit about your football journey and um, maybe why you chose to play football at 6'9", uh, 290, rather than playing maybe basketball or something of that nature, where a lot of people, you know, they have questions about that. They're like, man, he's a big dude, but I wonder why he's not on the basketball court. So it kind of gives a little rundown of your, your history in sports as, as a whole. Well, I come from Philly, so, you know, Philly like a, a basketball city. You know, so it was like basketball or nothing, really. You know what I mean? I didn't play football until I was about a freshman in high school. So that's like that's kind of late for like most people. But, uh, you know, won a state championship in basketball, all that good stuff. Had scholarships to go play basketball, plenty of places. But, you know, um, I kind of got like that shack effect during, uh, during my time playing and shit. Uh, I was just bigger than everybody, and so I, it wasn't fair. You know, they was calling fouls on me that I don't think I should have got, and they just made an easier choice to go play football. You know, use all my attributes in a, in a in the best way, and that was on the football field. You know, so I wouldn't be getting penalties for you know doing what I'm good at, and so that's that's really what got me into football. Um, went to Penn State. Uh, Joe Paterno, Coach Larry Johnson, you know, all them legendary coaches out there. Can't really beat that. Can't really beat that, you know, which which ultimately ended me up at Baylor. Going through uh, the Sandusky scandal and all that ended me up at Baylor. And, you know, the rest is history from there. Totally. And, and that's one thing I wanted to touch base on is because a lot of people may not know that about your story. Now, those who followed you do, but – a lot of people might not even realize that you did go to Penn State. That's originally where you went to, and then there that whole thing happened. Um, if you could pick one thing that, like, that entire situation as a player going over to that program, the the whole scandal and everything, everything that happened that kind of blew things up, what it taught you uh, as you made your way to Baylor that might have set the foundation for some things later on in your life, what was one of the biggest uh, life lessons that that whole situation taught you, Sean? Uh, you know, hey. In this in this political game that we play, no one's really safe. You know, um, you always have to be above and beyond the person that the world may think you are. You know, you always gotta 
take that next step and, and, and be a better leader. You know, enough is never enough, you know. And I learned that from uh, from Joe Paterno, you know, um, a legendary coach, you know, that, that, that gave his life. They gave years and decades to, to one university and, and to be discarded in, in a matter of, of days and in a matter of weeks uh, to just to be disfaced from the university. Um, it really opened my eyes to, to uh, the real politics that, that, that goes along with, you know, loving, loving your sport. Interesting. Totally true, too. So I think, I mean, especially hearing it from somebody who was kind of close to that situation, just being part of that program and being there, that's actually like super important for us all to remember as well. As you get over to Baylor, obviously, this is where your career started taking off big time. You started becoming, you know, a nationally known defensive, you know, lineman. And like I said, the big the big uh, internet fiasco when 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 the uh, the meme came out when you were playing against Michigan State, but that 2014 15 or sorry 2015 16 area was like when the NFL scouts started to come you know looking for you. Talk to us about your playing days at Baylor. Like what what was it like if you rewind the clock and go into Baylor? What were you you know what was the playing days like there? The competition because now a lot of people don't remember that Baylor was a, a solid program for quite some time and they too went through some some issues that have kind of flipped the program upside down and they're trying to rebuild that, that image now. But what was it like when you were there? Oh, it was love, you know, putting up 70 points a game, you know, shutting out the best, well, what they considered the best at that time. You know, ain't nothing like being an underdog and coming out on top, you know, uh, consecutively two years in a row, you know, in our conference. So, you know, I came during the glory time, you know, the glory, the glory days, you know, I didn't, I put in some of that labor to get to those days, but, you know, a lot of those guys before us laid that foundation, you know, like Robert Griffin and Kendall Wright and, you know, Philip Blake and all those guys, um, they all laid that foundation for us to, to, to be able to compete for those, those big 12 championships that we do have, you know, so it, it was all, it was all love for me, you know, we was winning. We was on the biggest stages, uh, and we looked the best as, as well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt, man, no doubt. I loved watching those Baylor squads. They were they were exciting, no doubt. Who was the, the best player you think you've played a, played beside when you were um, – played alongside, I should say, during your time at Baylor? Uh, probably our quarterback, Seth Russell. Uh, you know, he was a uh, – he doesn't look like it, like an athlete, but – he was definitely an athlete, like 6'4", could jump out the gym, run, throw, lead. Um, but he broke his neck during the game, you know, so it was, that kind of ended his career kind of short. So Interesting. I, it, it's it's interesting you say that because he didn't look like an athlete, but to hear from you, somebody who was around him, that is that's yeah. good to hear. Yeah, um, yeah <laughs> that's crazy. It, it's always funny how that happens if you're around some of these guys <laughs> – to the to the normal person they might not look like an athlete but you're like nah man these dudes can these dudes can get up or these dudes can move um talk to us about your what you know when you were you had the national spotlight on you was that tough as an athlete for these younger athletes out there that might be listening to this show across the globe was that tough for you as an athlete and how did you handle that situation by putting in the work every day and making sure that you came with all the pressures of the media and everybody on on top of you during those you know especially those last two years of your, your Baylor season, your Baylor career, I should say. It really wasn't that much pressure, you know. Um, luckily, for uh, like for me, I had I had great people around me. You know, I had great coaches, you know, and they always remind me not to eat the cheese, you know, because at the end of the day, like, they going to praise you and they going to hate you at the same time. So you just take it with a grain of salt. Like, you know, my phone was blowing up from the media, but, like, the media can't get you into no combine. The media can't get you into no national championship. The media can't do none of that stuff for you. So it was really just a, a mind state that, you know what I mean, this is supposed to happen. You know, they're supposed to, you know, flock and drool over you. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's supposed to happen. Why? Because you put in the work. You put in the work for that. You know what I mean? But you can't you can't get over jealous. You know what I mean? And, and think you, you all that in a bag of chips when, you know, every day is a work day. 
I dig that. Don't eat the cheese. I think that's actually super helpful for the young guys that I coach as well. I hope they're listening to this and uh, take that, you know, as, as they continue to improve. And maybe at this point they're in high school, but the college scouts are looking at them. Just remember, like, yeah, you're going to start getting some recognition, but yeah, you got to you got to stay humble. You got to keep going and putting in the work. Obviously, that's something that you did um, at the end of your career at Baylor, obviously going into the draft. This is the big. The big headline, everything came out in, in the media with the legal issues, the, the stuff that went down in your career. And there was a three year spurt of time where you were dealing with that, um, having to deal with the, the situation that was at hand. And now I don't necessarily want to get into the details of that. Uh, I don't want to make you have to talk about that, but I would like to learn from you as you went from being a, a, a perspective, you know, a, a huge prospect in the NFL, potential, you know, draft pick, high round draft pick to having to deal with those things. What, how did you get through it on a day-to-day thing? It's, it's obvious that you have a good mindset as far as like battling it through adversity throughout your life, especially with the Penn state thing, you're going to Baylor, you're going to deal with this, but it's easier said than done. And so that's what I really wanted to know, Sean, is how you got to the mindset to battle through and keeping faith in the next day, the next step forward and everything like that. It, uh, it was really, everybody got a choice. You know what I mean? I had to look at myself in the mirror and, and, and realize that I had a choice. You know what I mean? I'm either going to – I had two choices to make. I'm either going to, you know, be who they say I am and, and crash out and, you know, take on all the stipulation that, that you're calling me and all the names that you're calling me and every, take take all that on full force. Or I could, you know, take take the other route, you know, um, the, the struggle route. Uh just strap up my boots and, and figure it out each and every day, you know. But uh, I, I, cho- I chose the harder route. I, cho- I chose the harder route, and I don't know. It was I, a lot. Of, I feel like it's easier to take, you know, take the easy way out. You know, it's easy to to like take a plea deal. It's easy to do all those things. You know, um, I, I I never had it easy. So <laughs> I, right. I, just, I just I just kept really on that same path of, you know, doing your due diligence. You know what I mean? Same thing being an athlete. You want to be great, you got to do your due diligence. You got to be the first one and the last one out. You know what I mean? You want to be a leader, you can't be a leader just sometimes. You know, I had to lead by example many a times. And that was just one of the times that I was just leading by example. You know, I was my, my mouth was closed, but my actions were steady. You know, my statement has never changed from the beginning when the whole situation started to the end when the whole situation started. You know, I was steadfast in everything I did. And and, and truly, God brought me out of that because I was able to sit still. I commend you for that. That was one of the things that I personally um, thought was so, so awesome and unique about your particular situation was the plea deal, you know, there, like you mentioned just right now, it's easy to take a plea deal and they do want you to do that. I've, I've read a lot of different court cases. They want you to take a plea deal, but what that ultimately does, if you think that you're, you know, truly not guilty, the plea deal essentially shows that you are, and it admits guilt. And if you know that you're not, it's, it's hard. I would imagine if I'm putting myself in your position, someone of your caliber, someone, you know, that has that, that name, and having to deal with all the backlash, all the noise, you know, the outside noise and, and to not, you know, and, and like you said, you said, you stayed true to yourself and you, you trust the process the entire way through, which again is much easier said than done. And that's why I always had a, a, a big spot in my heart for you because I thought that was just so, so awesome where a lot of people would take the easy route and be like, okay, I'm just going to deal with this. But you knew there was a bigger goal at hand. You know, when you got out, when the, when the, when the, the, the verdict came out. It was not guilty. You know, talk to us about your emotions, if you if you wouldn't mind telling me about your emotions and and kind of what you went through at, at that day. Oh man, it was it was surreal. You know, it was definitely like a movie. Um, from the from the time he uh, hit the gavel on the, on a little stand, it was uh, it was unreal. Um, emotions are, are really like unspoken for. Like uh, it was just. You knew work work was meant to be done. You know, it was still a lot of work to be done. Um, sign of relief, really. Um, really just thankful and grateful, you know what I mean? Because during that whole process, you got to realize there's nothing I had, like I did that, that was magical. You know what I mean? There's nothing I did. Absolutely all. 
that was like in my control that that could have got me out of that situation. You know what I mean? And that's where you really gotta like thank God for like being being able to move mountains. You know what I mean? So it, it was just a, really just a sign of, of my belief and my, my faith system that <laughs> that uh that I got through that, you know what I mean? It, it was just all those tears and that was all just thanks. Just thanks, just, just being thankful. I love it, man. Did you really get a tattoo after you left the courthouse? There was a, an article written that I had read probably about a year ago that it talked about you said you were going to go to a, get a tattoo. Was that Did that actually happen? Yeah, most likely. I don't know what I got. <laughs> yeah, most likely. You know, I do a lot of things on spur of the moment, but yeah, most likely. Okay, that's that's awesome, man. Hey, so you go and you get through this this uh, part of your life, which I'm sure you can probably help a lot of people with your story here. A lot of, unfortunately, this is something that happens quite frequently, uh, or at least I should say more than it should. Um, so hopefully your story can help others. Now, as you were deciding to get back into football, what do you think the hardest thing was trying to get back into the like, the the professional football game now now you're in the professional ranks what do you think is the hardest thing that's been transitioning into the professional game in those you know it's been over two years now or right at two years that this has all gone down and you've been able to get back to your playing your playing days what's the hardest transition it's it, it, the game is easy it's the mental transition you know it, it's it's knowing that you ain't got nothing else to prove but but yeah your athletic ability you know what I mean. It's, it's, it's being able to block out the noise. It's it's maturing. You know what I mean? It's it's being able to be a leader and be a follower at the same time. You know, because you, you deserve. You think you deserve more, but you you in your position where you gotta you gotta you gotta follow. You know, and and, and the greatest leaders are some of the greatest followers. So I'm in a position of, of great height. You know, um, I'm surrounded by great guys. You know, guys that that's been in the NFL, guys that's you know made a name in the CFL, and, and I'm in the perfect position where where their experience and, and and their abilities is just gonna catapult me to exactly where I need to be. I dig that. So iron sharpens iron. You're surrounding yourself with the right types of people. What I thought was interesting as well, Sean, is you get out, and it was during the time that the XFL was going on. You had an, a, a short stint with the XFL. And I'd like to know your thoughts on the XFL um, as an organization while it was still going before the pandemic hit. I've spoken to a few players that actually had opportunities to play there. What were your uh, thoughts and, and the experience for you overall? Um, were you grateful for the XFL? Did you feel like it was a good experience to get some game reps in or what was your overall thoughts there? Yeah, man, it was, it was, it was my first time, you know, strapping up the, strapping up the helmet for a while so it was like I, I couldn't i couldn't really i took it as a grain of salt you know i couldn't take it as anything else you know you understand that this game is a privilege and so anytime i really get to play you know i'm i'm, I'm thankful you know I'm, I'm i'm completely thankful and, and totally grateful for the opportunity because you know as at a point in time i never thought i'd play this game again totally man I like that. Um, as you're as you're looking back on your career so far, I mean, you're right now your playing days. You're, I, I feel like you're just getting started. Um, you're now in the CFL and you're getting you're rocking and rolling. Um, people might look at an age and be like, "Yeah, Yo, you're late twenties, yeah," but you're just getting started and you got fresh legs. It seems like too, like you're you're ready to rock and roll. But if you could look back on the twenty year old Sean Oakman, what would you tell yourself now? Uh, it's not over. It's never over. It's never over, you know. Um, stay, stay hungry. Stay, stay, you know. Stay prayed up, and understand that it's a long life to live. You know, it's not, it's not just about football. You know, it's, 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 it's deeper than football, and it's, and it's longer than football. You know, this life thing that we go through each and every day is, is something else. You know, and if you ain't got a good head on your shoulder, this life. This life will smack you in the face and, and you won't be able to get up. And if you were to talk to some, you know, younger athletes, Sean, uh, about what it takes now that you know what it takes to play at the next level, you've played at a high level collegiate realm and now you're in the professional ranks. You know, some people might not understand what it takes to go there, the physical nature and, and, and what, you know, that's obviously some of that's genetics and some of that's hard work in the gym, but 
what all does it take? What would you, what advice would you give these younger athletes that are looking to make it to the next level? Maybe to go to the, the college realm and play sports there. Like what's a day like for you? You know, is it film study? Is it whatever you mentioned? Men, the mental side of things is, is a lot tougher in the, in the professional game. What advice would you give to the younger athletes out there that are on the up and up? Uh, ain't no, really no days off. You know what I mean? Especially if you, if you a small dude, you, you know what I mean? If you a big dude and uh, another big dude coming, but if you a small dude, it's a million, 10 billion of y'all, you know? Um, so it ain't really no days off. You know, you can't be, you can't be somebody some days and, and another person other days. You know what I mean? If the person you are is the person you're going to be, you know, that it, it's, it's a character issue. You know what I mean? Um, it's, it's, it's the lessons that you got to learn. That's not taught, you know, um, it's, 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 it's putting a pride, your pride aside and, and, and doing things that you don't want to do, you know? It, it's it's doing those things that you hate to do, but doing them like you love them, you know? So it, it, it's a multitude of things and, and and you probably won't get there, you know? And, and none of us probably gonna get to any of the aspiration that we think we deserve or we think we should be. But at the end of the day, You'll never know if you give up too soon, you know. So that's what I tell them. That's that's exactly what I say, because I feel like most people just stop when that shit just 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 getting too hard, you know. And as soon as that shit get too hard, that's when that shit open wide open for somebody else, because because you just stop. I dig it. I love it, man. So Sean, as you're you're playing in the CFL, what are the uh, expectations? Uh, for us as fans to kind of, you know, get to watch you guys. I know COVID kind of shut down all sports, especially the CFL in the last, you know, year and a half, two years, whatever. But now we finally get to see you on the field again. Talk to us about what the expectations are for the rest of the season and uh, what we should expect to see from you in your career. Is the NFL still the goal? Or are you taking it day by day right now? And just like you said, it's a privilege. So are you just kind of taking it and being being thankful that you're strapping up again? Uh, it's definitely the goal. It's always the goal. Don't, we're always going to set the goal high, you know, so. I'm always going to be short for the NFL, um, but today is, is getting better each day. You know, it's learning from these vet guys. It's, it's, I have never been around such a group of talented, you know, pass rushers besides myself, you know. And so I'm able to sit there and really learn from these different types of different types of people, you know, different types of individuals from different walks of life that, that has a lot to teach me on and off the field. So... It's, it's always the goal. Um, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna win a great cup, and my defense is gonna be dominant. Um, last game, last team that we played, they had 17 total rushing yards. So um, we bring we bring in something, you know, something that Toronto hasn't seen before, and, and we're ready for all comers. I dig it. I look forward to watching you the rest of the season and seeing where you take your career. And I just want to say thank you, Sean, for taking the time out of your day to uh, speak with us here on the podcast and just share your story with us. It's uh, it's inspiring for me. Adversity is something that you're not unfamiliar with, but you've been able to overcome it. And that is super cool to me. I love to learn from people like yourself and uh, just hearing you know the steps that it takes to get through it. And I, I'm inspired by your story. I just want to say thanks once again for joining the show today, man. Nah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it so much. Absolutely, brother. For all those out there, make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. Tune in next week. We'll be coming to you with another interview. Take care. Guys, thanks so much for listening to another episode of my show. Now, if you could go and do me a favor, head over to iTunes, give me five stars and leave me a review. It would be greatly appreciated. Thanks, guys. Appreciate your support.